Um, I think we're going to wait about a couple more seconds um, as people file into uh, our um, Zoom room here uh, and also for us to catch up a little bit on streaming. Um, but uh, this is, I guess, the second part of a debate regarding um, protocols and certifications. And I believe the theme that we'd established uh, was um, you know, the issues of, of contact tracing and things like that during global health crises and the uh, toss-ups that people have to make uh, between uh, a being effective and preserving people's privacy. Uh, before we kick it off, do we want to um, discuss anything else um, before uh, jumping into it uh, regarding, I guess, uh, what people should do in the chat or the Q&A or, or how to raise their hand or anything like that before we start? Sure. I mean, uh, if anybody wants to ask a question while somebody else is talking, you can enter it in chat. Uh, if you want to speak or respond, then also the same. Uh, but uh, unless uh, possibly during the actual discussions, maybe just raise your finger and we can notice that you would like to add a point. Otherwise, uh, enter it uh, in the chat, please. Okay. So uh, we have a lot to get through in the time that we have. So uh, shall we do a very, very brief round, um, maybe two sentences of introductions with our panelists? Uh, who shall we start with? Let's go with Cherry. Hello, everyone. I'm the CTO of uh, Your R&D. Um, we're based out of Norway, the mother company. And I look at the R&D parts of it in Singapore. Um, we're a food startup. So we're very interested in the future of food uh, and agriculture. Excellent. All right. Um, who else do we have? Uh, Leah? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me here. I'm Leah Diaz. I'm actually Australian, but I live in France. Um, I'm the CEO of Qua Factor. We're a, a blockchain-based traceability company that works in the healthcare space. Um, I'm a, pharmac a clinical um, pharmacist by background and also a digital health stra strategist. So looking forward to the session today. Cool. Thank you. What do we have on the line? I think that actually might be it for, for today. Is, uh, is Jochen part of this panel? Oh, wait, yes, yes. Jochen is here. Yeah, I think uh, um, I don't fit too much to this panel here, but I will use the chance to listen to your all the experts and maybe um, have a question because okay. what I try seems to be pretty new to include aesthetics in uh, digital medicine, because I think personalization is a bit too much molecular based. So I try maybe to understand protocols as a very basic thing. So my question could be, maybe it doesn't make sense, but it could be if there are maybe protocols for aesthetic, like images or diagrams, which be, could be used for digital health. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, that's actually a pretty good question, and we might come back to that. Um, but let's actually start with the protocols themselves. So uh, I guess we're all coming from different, uh, uh, different regional perspectives. Um, what do we see right now um, that are, are like problematic? Let's start with the problems first, um, regarding the way that um, these type of protocols are incorporated uh, in, in use in, in your particular area of expertise. Don't be shy or I'll call on someone. <laughs> I, think the, I think the trick is to call on someone directly because people are either shy or being polite and waiting for somebody okay. else. Fair enough. Uh, Leah, would you like to start? Sure. So um, I work in healthcare. So uh, some of the, and I guess with in terms of the COVID, for example, like let's let's focus on this. It's about um, privacy of data, and I think um, around the initial starts of implementing some of these contact tracing apps, there was a lot of, uh, I guess, what I, I've seen is a lot of, uh, I guess, discomfort around using the apps, and also people really being. Um, 
really un unfamiliar with how this data is going to be used. And you've seen in some countries where you've had full implementation of the, the contact tracing in, in South Korea and in China, where they've been very successful, but it has come as a bit of a compromise. And so it's actually balancing that compromise of like, uh, public health care and so on with actually how do we keep patients safe and so you can see some of this uh, the evolving of the bluetooth applications and so on and particularly for me I work in the decentralized space so we're looking at how we protect patient data and privacy and and building the protocols around that as well to to protect that patient data and health information I think has been um, foremost in our minds as we're going forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned you, you're in the decentralized space. What, is, what does that mean? Okay, so decentralized uh, uh, technology. So in, in terms of patients, um, so basically not one person owning the data. So actually having uh, the data, well, so the patient owns the data. So it's a bit transformative. So we've seen in the, in the past particularly that um, it's been, and we've been talking in the groups about it, healthcare has been quite paternal in its approach. So it's been a bit of a top-down approach where healthcare facilities, um, governments, uh, hospitals, GPs own the data. And, you know, we sort of are looked after as patients when we go to hospital and so on. But we don't really have any... Um, we, we don't gather that information or have any decision making around our own healthcare based on the data that we, we, we should be getting. And so, well, I think we, we should have access to. So it's about how we get access to that information into the future and how that information gets shared with different parties. So for example, a radiologist, a GP, a hospital that we go to. So it's decentralizing, but keeping the data with the patient. So, so that's, um, the space we're working in at the moment. Very interesting. Okay. Jerry, how about you? Hi. Um, yeah, I'm very curious about some of the work that Lee is doing, but I'll maybe take that offline. Um, so maybe I should uh, sort of step back from my original introduction because uh, it looks like uh, there's a little bit of the COVID conflict uh, in this discussion. Um, and um, uh, I must disclose that um, I, I'm, I'm from Kerala in India, South, South India, and I was visiting here when the um, sort of the pandemic uh, kind of went, went out of China, if you like. Um, and um, I think uh, the state has been in the press for the way it handled it with contact tracing and so on. Uh, so I've kind of witnessed it uh, inside of India um, and not so much from Singapore, so it's difficult for me to give a Singapore angle um, to this. But um, um, what's interesting is that um, there's, uh, I perceive to have a direct uh, sort of conflict between privacy and uh, medical surveillance because the government sort of imposes on you the obligation uh, and society imposes on you the obligation to report everybody that you've met uh, inside of a period if you're suspected to have had um, exposure to the virus. Um, and so immediately there is a sort of privacy uh, concern that comes out and how this relates to um, sort of who has this information and how it's handled um, on top of the fact that uh, very quickly, um, in many cases, uh, the uh, sort of consent about your inf the private information uh, is suddenly gone. Um, so, so I sort of witnessed it from from that angle. And then, um, after the central government, which is the Indian central government, uh, decided that it uh, had a bit more of a grip on uh, how to handle the pandemic, um, they came up with this uh, copycat idea, I believe, from South Korea, which was to um, use technology. Uh, to automate um, the um, uh, automate the surveillance of people's movements and their contacts, so they mandated that uh, they were going to uh, send out an application, like a, a, um, a phone application, uh, which people were required to have installed on their phones um, uh, if they were to be able to travel. Uh, so at the moment, I've heard reports, uh, mostly anecdotal, from friends who want to travel, and then at the 
uh, sort of points of entry into public transport. Um, this application is checked to be installed in the first place uh, and is liable to further inspection, which means that your telephone, which so far had been sort of a uh, sphere of privacy, as it were, uh, is now subject to uh, scrutiny without any form of um, legal procedure. Uh, so that's so that's sort of the the privacy angle to my experience. And then uh, the second aspect is the software itself, which uh, now um, uh, brings in a whole lot of issues with uh, who is it possible to travel without a mobile phone which is capable of running this application. There are millions, hundreds of millions of people in India at least who don't have access to this. Um, and what is the software? Uh, what is the um, technology that runs? What kinds of information does it get from your phone other than uh, uh, you know, purportedly the health-related information that's running on your phone? Um, and so interestingly, there was a narrative around this. Uh, some visible people actually hacked, quote unquote, uh, the application and they found out various things about it. And it, it came to the point where the government was forced to kind of open at least the user facing sides of the app. It's now open source. It's called the Arukia Setu app. Um, and, it's, and it's out there for the public to, uh, to see the source code. Um, and mm -hmm. so I guess that can sort of. Um, yeah, so I think that sort of intersects with um, uh, issues of, uh, you know, when, when this kind of social crisis happens, um, you know, are governments prepared to, um, uh, assuming, the, you know, democratic governments, are they prepared to, um, prepared to handle that in a way that is uh, uh, reasonably uh, systematic and therefore... I assume I could apply the ideas of protocols and certification of details in that context. So, yes. yeah, that's my, yeah. Um, that's a great, great response. And that's given us a lot to think about. So uh, we definitely do want to think about the role of um, open source. Uh, if a, a government is going to exert so much power over the populace in that way. And we also want to think about protocols. So um, I want to, to, like, another question that I want you to think about for later is, um, that the fact that there was an API that was written um, in collaboration with Google and Apple uh, in order to be the baseline for contact tracing apps and a variety of countries totally um, ignored that and kind of went ahead with their own thing in order to like uh, unsafe uh, in order to lead to unsafe implementations and actually for everybody who's on the line I dropped a link into the chat um, of this article that just came out a couple of days ago by Amnesty International, where they reverse engineered several contact tracing apps and found that they were doing wildly different, unsafe things in totally different ways. So I wanted everybody to think about that and we'll come back to that. Um, but in the meanwhile, we have uh, Ileana Marquez who joined us, who's another participant of ours. And we did not get to do a sound check with Ileano, but I'm hoping that it'll just magically work and um, you can give us a brief Two sentence introduction um, about uh, your work and uh, what kind of stance you take on this topic. Absolutely. And it does work, I hope. Um, uh, yeah. I yes. yeah, perfect. Um, I've, I've done a few already and everything worked, so I, 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 I felt that this wouldn't be an issue. Um, so I, I work in data, um, I work in AI for the last uh, 13 years. Um, everything that I have done was related to building intelligent systems uh, on top of data. Um, and therefore, data is um, at, at the you know, front and center of everything that I do um, in many industries. So not on a specific industry. Uh, I am now in a particular industry, but you know, it's not specific. Um, and if I'm very honest with you, um, this whole importance of data privacy has not been something that I've started to work, you know, now. Uh, it's something that, you know, I've been looking uh, into for many years, especially for uh, not just the, 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 the elements around the privacy of an individual per se, but more around the ethical and the transparency of some intelligence systems and their role on society. I clearly believe whilst there isn't a right or wrong, there is a very good separation between good purpose and bad purpose, uh, good uh, role in the society and bad role in the society. And, 
um, there are there, there, there definitely need to be protocols and roles in um, in 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 the society and in in some bodies and some organizations to address it. Um, I think that exploded with some of the things that are happening in COVID-19, especially on the healthcare sector. But I was just saying before uh, in the conversation we just had uh, to where that I, I think there is a lot of foundations missing in uh, uh, the healthcare sector globally um, and the role that some institutions need to have um, to actually build those foundations. I think Lee was pointing to some of the things they're doing, which is great. But I, I think there are a lot of foundations missing. There's a lot of foundations in other industries that are not available in healthcare. And there are hospitals that two departments inside the hospital don't share data within the hospital. So if you want an exam that a doctor did in department A and he needs to go to department B, they still probably have to walk to department A to get that data. And, and, and this, you know, just thinking of a concept, for example, of a research initiative to detect cancer, for example, between two hospitals that are not part of the same group. It's just impossible today. And, and um, you know, a lot of the AI research, for example, still centers on digital numbers being handwritten and people kind of building computer vision algorithms on top, which is, you know, a nightmare compared to, you know, what the world really needs. So, so everything that, that, that I've, I've kind of tried to emphasize is I think there's a, a need for a big foundational debate around data in the healthcare, but also on some of the governing bodies. Um, accountability. I mean, to be honest, you could say, I, I think you were mentioned before, Apple and Google, they were kind of putting together some thoughts. You know, China started this uh, tracing with, with Teradata in, in, in China. And it worked very well. I'm not sure why they're not using that. But for me, what is the role of who in this? The World Health Organization should be the ones that should be creating these things. They should be, you know, building capabilities to enable data sharing, data uh, availability for different purpose. Think about this for a second. We're talking about traceability. What best traceability do we want than the airline tickets? to sustain a particular epidemic in, a, in, a, in the world. Forget about the country for a second. You know, it becomes a world problem when people are flying around from one place to the other, infected. You know, we have government bodies, we have, but you know, where is the accountability to define these things at a global level, which then can cascade down to a particular country? Um, and therefore, you know, I'm all up for data sharing. You know, I live, my, my whole career has been providing intelligence with data, but on the good side, I, I hope that is clear. Um, and I think there's so much that can be done. There is so much value for the society that we can create without compromising on privacy and ethical and, and transparency. And I think that the foundational piece uh, needs to be worked very urgently and clear accountabilities need to be created to certain bodies because otherwise, why do you have them? Yeah. Um, that's a really, really excellent uh, set of ideas that you put out there. Um, so one thing that I would love to pick up on, and uh, if any of the, the other panelists want to, to chime in on this, um, is the, the role of, uh, of data sharing. Like, so if we had to share our travel histories um, not only internationally, but probably regionally with the World Health Organization, what problems do you foresee in terms of our privacy, in terms of our sovereignty, um, that uh, variety of member states within the, the um, WHO might abuse? Anybody? Leah? Leah? Um, so, sorry, I was uh, I was sort of focusing more on Ilano's uh, uh, problem that he approached, which I think I want to talk about first, if that's okay, Harlow, okay. before I get onto your question. Um, so, just thinking about that, uh, the the problem about the fragmentation of data, I think, is is something that occurs through healthcare. So, where you've got definitely where you have ICU and different parts of your healthcare system that isn't sharing data with each other. So, there's 
infrastructure, technical infrastructure problems that are there now. And I see that as a, an issue at the moment in terms of uh, how do we um, protect our data when we don't have access even to this data and also no, no body has access to get, gathering this data in a way that's gonna be beneficial in terms of patient care, for example. And the second part is like about disparity, like in, in we've got this situation where you've got your more marginalized societies that there's been more exploitation potentially of data because of uh, no governing laws around uh, that, that uh, you know, that they um, adhere to like GDPR, for example, or HIPAA and so on. Mm -hmm. So, I think those two things are really important to actually bridge that gap. And I, I really think that accountability and traceability are really important there. And coming back to your point then, Harlow, about uh, this, uh, you know, what does privacy mean in terms of travel and so on? How do we get uh, patients with their digital identity and, and their identification also be able to share that information in a way, but protect the information that you don't want to share as well. And at the moment, we don't even know what's being shared and, and how we um, we agree to uh, certificates and protocols and so on that are uh, protocols that are happening, that we, we're sharing data, but we don't actually know how that data is being used and we don't know what impact that will have on us in, into the future as well. And I think that these are really mm -hmm. important points because what it does is it creates scaremongering in people so that there's a lot of fake information that goes out there as well. Um, I challenge Liano in terms of is it up to the World Health Organization to like they do data sharing at the moment in terms of programs and organizations and we've definitely used some of that data around uh, medical conditions but is it that body that's supposed to be in place to do data sharing or is there the potential for another body to come in to do that but I think that that's a really important point that in a situation like a pandemic where you need fast action and we need to be able to share data in a way that is beneficial to humanity, um, but also doesn't stop economies from working and so on. And, and I think that, that this has been a really interesting space. There's a company, um, well, three companies that have merged out of Switzerland and they they brought an interesting sort of case that I've been looking at a bit from a, from a um, technical aspect. One is a French, uh, leader who's managing open health data. The second company is uh, SIGPA, which is providing authentication and secured traceability technology. And the third company is a blockchain company, so they do time stamping. And what they're looking at is things like immunity passports. So patients can have that information on their system or their, their smartphone, for example. They can, if they're approached by authorities, this information holds whether the patient is has had antibody testing, for example, they've had, um, they've been cleared for COVID and, and this information can be then seen by people and will allow them to go back and work in, in, in society or have, have um, contact with other people. And if you don't have this immunity passport or you haven't sort of got the antibodies, for example, then you are then doing social distancing. So, I think these type of things are really interesting from a privacy point of view and also how we get um, people movement, movement back in society where we're not all confined and inactive to our homes. And, and I think these are important points as well. So the challenge for me is, is this a responsibility of a World Health Organization or is it for us to sort of find well, well, a new space? I 100% agree. Um, and, and I think the, the point about the bodies is, is it a global body, a regional body? Um, but one point that, uh, by the way, thanks for your comments. I, I really appreciate them and they make sense. I, I, if that's okay, can I just make a, a, a yeah, okay. Yes, I, I think one point that you mentioned, um, which is a point that I've been trying to also, you know, address in, in public speeches and in many other occasions is uh, first, um, um, I've been sharing this, it's the first time in this conference that, uh, or this summit that I've, I've been trying to address. First, we need to make sure that wh whatever bodies are created, they uh, are not purely focusing on bringing fear into the society. I think today, all the, the rules, the, the, uh, the laws are very much putting fear on the societies if you and therefore the outcomes of that is people are doing it because it's the law and they are feared 
instead of looking at value creation. The example that Liam just mentioned now is a value creation situation for us to move forward. A lot of GDPR compliance organizations that are giving stamps to companies is to overcome fear. Oh my God, I'm going to have 5% of my revenue being taken away if I don't do this. That's important. No, the, the, the privacy is not important because the revenue you're going to you know, be losing. It is important for all the other factors that you're not addressing. So I think whatever laws, whatever bodies comes together, one of the massive things that I believe you know, is relevant and important to address is to put and, and set up laws and regulations for value creation on top of transparency, on value creation for the society. There's a lot of things we can do with data for good. The regulation needs to address that. And, and the second point I, I'll pass over to, 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 to you uh, straight away is, is um, and I completely agree, maybe it's not who, maybe somebody else, maybe it's more than one, I don't know that, but somebody has to take accountability of being the bridge between the digital identity. And whilst this is now very important in healthcare, this is actually cross-governmental and cross-industries. Somebody needs to take that accountability and we as a society need to expect a lot of, like you do expect certain things from the banks sometimes a bank you know uh, goes uh, into a bankruptcy situation and we are all upset about it but generally speaking we do trust in banks we put our savings our salaries in there we pay our right there is that that role in the society we need a broker like that for our digital identities and somebody, and somebody has to take a, a step forward in being that, to bring trust into the society. And therefore, we look at that data for value creation and not fearing, you know, uh, what, what's happening. So I'll stop here and just hand over to you. Sarah, do you have any response to, to that? Um, especially as it like comes into tension with, I mean, like, can something like that be open source? Can something like that be transparent? Mm, can I talk? I'm yes. going to do an indirect answer and ask Sherry my question. Did I put it to the chat um, concerning this value aspect? Um, I, I looked a bit around in Europe about cultural aspects of medicine. And what impressed me only almost most was in Karlsruhe. There's an art-based technology school. And they developed um, programs how, for example, in India, some rituals have been transformed into diagrams. And so I can imagine that nowadays there are diagrams, graphics, symbols, which could be a little bit less personalized and maybe be used also as a transport system in the community to understand health. So I would like to know from Cherry if there is an India already institution. Uh, you're frozen a little bit, but uh, I did want to actually, I had that in my notes to pick up later uh, as, another, uh, as another type of protocol that we might want to, to talk about, which is the internationalization protocol. But let me um, kick it back to Cherry uh, to, uh, uh, to address um, yeah, uh, the role of, of an organization to do this global bridge building and doing it somehow transparently, if that's a possibility. Hi, okay, well, um, there's a few things to unroll. I've been kind of attempting to keep up by taking notes. Uh, maybe you will just roll back last last out first in or last in the first out kind of thing. Uh, so if I could address Joshin's question very briefly. Um, I Kerala, where I am right now and I'm, where I'm from, um, we, we do have a government body that regulates Ayurveda, which is uh, traditional medicine. So there is um, a legal framework around which Ayurveda wor uh, works. Uh, and there are protocols and, and regulations about what sorts of treatments they're allowed to give and not allowed to give. Um, however, uh, sometimes it does um, get difficult because uh, the boundaries are uh, unclear about who is an Ayurveda practitioner. So, for example, a couple of years ago, I met someone from a tribal area where they, ha where they have their own uh, non-Vedic Ayurvedic uh, sort of traditional medicine, rather. Um, treatment and uh, this person was not certified by the government to be giving treatment. Um, so, um, so from a sort of certification point of view, um, 
uh, this is still an open question about legitimacy and trials and and therefore I, I really can't answer the diagnostics question because I, this is out of my area of uh, work. Uh, but just to say that yes, there is interaction between government and non uh, non uh, well traditional uh, types of medicine where I am at the moment. We can take it up offline later for uh, for another discussion. Um, I just wanted to address um, Eliano's uh, question of uncertainty in the context of uh, COVID, um, especially for businesses. Um, and uh, and this is we we as a startup, for example, really see this because our sources of funding are holding on uh, to their money because you know the times are uncertain. Um, every single business out there, I'm sure, has felt uh, this sort of uncertainty uh, at one level or, or another. Uh, and therefore, I, I believe that uh, it's uh, it, it's really important for everybody to work together uh, to find a way to reduce the misinformation or rather the lack of clear information uh, as came up from the discussion, um, which leads me back to Leah's point about um, patriarchal top-down prescriptive uh, systems in, in the medical medical world. Uh, and I've actually seen this first one. I never thought about it, but now I see it because my right to movement is dictated by the medical community. Uh, it, it's top-down. Uh, and I understand, of course, the, 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 the rationale behind it, which is why it actually is able to be enforced. But, uh, uh, but it's an interesting angle to, uh, to, to look at this, especially as, a, as someone who works with technology. Um, it's interesting for me to, to see how technology can actually um, percolate um, uh, it, for everybody to have access, uh, uh, use technology as a means to access information by which they can make um, uh, socially relevant and positive decisions, both about themselves and then uh, with their interactions uh, with others. Um, so to kind of, uh, that's a lot that I unpacked here, but like to kind of give it sort of an overall um, sort of label and structure, um, I would like to see um, from where I'm standing, um, what we call in, in, in computer science, uh, the policy versus mechanism question. Um, and so the policy um, of, uh, you know, the protocols and the details, which is relevant to everybody, but in the entire world, well, obviously it's like the ICD codes that you find in medicine, for example, you know, so those are, those are consolidated by the World Health Organization and, and they, they're compacted into this one sort of book of knowledge uh, from uh, conversations with various kinds of stakeholders. Uh, and then, and then the policy in, in this case, for example, with COVID, the policy around, say, pandemics or how governments need to um, take on these things could be centralized at the highest scope, global level, right, uh, where I see the, the WHO being relevant. But in terms of mechanism, um, I mean, disease is, a communicable disease is, uh, especially is a, is a very geographically local phenomenon. You, you, you transmit disease by physical direct contact with somebody else. So definitely there's a, there's a local aspect to it and it's handled uh, locally and therefore the mechanism of how to tackle these things I believe needs to be rooted locally uh, and then could sort of bubble up in a federated kind of decision making uh, mm -hmm. capacity. And that's my opinion at this point. I just wanted to jump in there. That's so many good points, Sherry, and definitely offline conversations around the paternal aspects of um, healthcare and health data. But I, I wanted to also comment on one of the biggest problems, I think, from a healthcare perspective with this COVID um, that, that we've seen is that, you know, is that we have no visibility around patients that have multiple comorbidity, they're high risk. Um, you know, why are men more exposed to older men dying from COVID um, rather than women? And so there's so much we don't know about this disease, and even in terms of how far uh, the particles spread, how long they remain in a room, how they're contacted. I mean, a lot of those answers are coming out now, but we require a lot of data to understand this as well. And I think that... Uh, Fortunately, um, a lot of uh, the more a lot of countries that we've all worked in have got good, robust systems to collect some of the. Well, sorry, they've got systems to collect these data, whether they're manual or whether they're IT systems. In uh, less developed countries, and that's projects that we're working on at the moment. Um, 
they don't have these systems that uh, that quickly can detect which are your high risk patients. And I think this is going to be issues going into the future around vaccinations and who to treat and so on as well. Because if we don't treat everybody that's high risk, and then there's a good chance that this will come up again. This this disease. So it's about the equality, this more than ever is about quality, about how we treat patients and, and being able to access the data on who are the patients that need it the most to start off with. So I think that there's some real challenges in that um, that I've seen as well. And I think um, just onto your point around um, health data and the paternal aspect, I think um, it's been in the best interests in the past to have this sort of top-down approach where, you know, we go to the hospital and they take care of us and so on. But as we've become empowered by more data, we're actually able to, to look after our health in a lot better way. And so this is about how now we can access this data because we're being patient-centric and then share them with other providers like a health nutrition or a health company or a food company, for example, or you know, whoever we want to share them to, having that power of using the health data how we want to do it. So that's the real transition that we're noticing. But, um, and it's a real education thing. So, you know, there's a lot of challenges that it brings up in that. So, yeah. um, um, Sherry, uh, thanks, Leah. Uh, Sherry, I have, I have a quick question um, for you, just, just to make sure I got, I got your point correct. So, you were giving the example of the, the trade-off on computer science between policy and, and, and implementation. Um, and um, of course, I, I understand the, the global uh, point that you're trying to make. My point, um, which if you want, um, probably um, just intersects yours is, you know, whilst I agree and understand that there needs to be locally implementations of whatever are those policies and adapt them to that particular individual country, the problem that Leah just pointed out is no longer uh, a country uh, problem in the context of a connected world. Let's take this example, and you will see where I think, you know, these digital identities, these bodies and these organizations that need to be guardians of uh, PII data and are the ones that, you know, to a certain degree, we trust in the same level, we trust institutional uh, financial institutions as we do still today, is for the following reason. Oxford, if, I think it was Oxford, but if it wasn't, you know, I believe it was uh, Oxford or a group of universities in UK, spent two or three months collecting data to reach the conclusion that people that smoke apparently got less infected than the others. I don't know if this was, you know, one university, a group. My point is two or three months collecting this data. And um, my, you know, comment and, and question is, you know, if uh, this, there isn't a, you know, a, a, a mechanism for, uh, you know, collecting that data locally, but having the ability for that data to be collected with standards that makes sharing uh, consistent. To be honest, the outcome that they have derived in two or three months of collecting data could have been done in five minutes. And maybe that information being published three months before could have helped a lot to continue some other further research. And I think we need to address this. We need to address this. We need to address, you know, when situations like this come, having fast access to data about people going from country A to country B, uh, if they were, you know, in very close contact with, with other people. So my, my point about, you know, having these institutions and having this kind of local entities that there needs to be coordination in terms of data, because data is very valuable if you can put it together. If, if you can't, because, you know, country A organized the data with just this detail, but, you know, I don't have a way to identify as a high risk. And then when you go to another country, I can, you will still going to, you know, spend way more time putting data together than we need instead of driving outcomes and value to situations like this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and with that, I believe that uh, we're coming to the, the end of our, our panel. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Cherry, Leah, Iliano, um, also um, uh, Joachim, and of course, Laird. Uh, there's a lot of optimism in this room. Uh, I really, really hope it, it carries over. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Very stimulating discussion.
alert and all. Hello, can anyone hear me? No. I can practically me. hear you. Ah, okay. Great. Hi everybody, sorry about the noises here. Hello everyone and welcome to the panel on how can citizens feel free, very existential questions. How can we help grassroots movements? Um, Kushal, would you do the honors of moderation of this panel? Uh, okay. Um, first, we feel that actually one way. Just like, I know like, uh, the ideas we want to discuss with this. Uh, uh, give me a second. We can't hear you very well. Because the internet is. Uh, just a second. My system is freezing up with internet. So. Before the initials, I'd like to hear uh, all the panelists. If this is a line of audio, it might help if you turn off. We can't hear you. It might help if you turn off the camera. Okay. For now, until at least it works a little bit. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hi, as I, my system is totally freezing up. So if, just in case if I drop out, someone should pick up um, the point. I'll be here. Uh, yes, so and welcome everyone uh, once again. And uh, as we said, uh, 
the idea was uh, to discuss about how we can help the grassroots movements. And this is a particular, uh, in this particular time of our civilization, I think that's becoming a much bigger point because we see these movements coming up not only one country or not for one single cause or one track, but it's happening all across the world. And it's, it starts creating a lot of other kind of questions, which uh, goes beyond the civil society as a, like the definition and goes both the government and technologists and all of us together. And uh, for my panelists uh, right now, before anything else, uh, I'd love to actually, you know, if you want to talk uh, like a, at least one single sentence about yourself, so that would be nice to start. Like before we jump into the questions we have ready for ourselves. Uh, Sabine, would you like to start? Oh yes, absolutely, sure. Um, so I'm uh, basically, I joined Poli Poli, uh, one of the um, co-organizers of uh, this event as chief data officer a while back. Um, and um, I've been in the space of data and the body for uh, about 20 odd years. Um, and over the past uh, five or so years, I have been primarily interested in data ethics, uh, creating business models um, that empower citizens and um, ensure that citizens do have uh, or gain also financial value from the raw material data. Um, so uh, a very big interest of mine are data cooperatives um, and how those are organized. Elena, can you go ahead? Yeah, yes, um, I'm actually not a panelist. Um, so I'm, I'm here to help you actually, Kushal. Um, oh. Uh, oh, okay. Dr. Johan? Or Eleanor? I don't know if we have... Yeah, I mean, um, all right, I'll, I'll start. Um, I'm a postdoc at Liverpool University. I'm working on two main projects. One of them is called Me and My Big Data around developing citizens' data literacies. Uh, the other one is uh, quite fresh. We just received it from the UKRI, um, which is uh, developing um, fake news immunity. So it's around COVID-19 and how we can help citizens uh, to understand um, and engage more meaningfully in, in terms of misinformation and disinformation. Um, I also recently, and I'm shamelessly going to uh, introduce my book, which was published three months ago. Um, and that actually is really related because um, I show how media companies big media companies have been shaping the way that we understand and engage with media uh, and how they've commercialized a lot of our sort of public spaces. Um, and so I'm very much interested in both um, how citizens can be empowered and how big media companies uh, try to prevent that through different kinds of infrastructures that they develop. Hi, uh, Mikhail, if you want to go ahead. Hey, yeah, thanks for having me on this panel. My name is Michael Mischke. I'm a board member, a founder and strategist of WeChange, which is a digital data cooperative uh, founded in Berlin. Uh, we also provided the platform for both and the community platform. It's a wide label product. And we run 14 of those platforms and the core platform has 40,000 users. And our main objective is to provide the civil society with tools for digital collaboration that are ethically correct and run by a democratically governed organization. And it's basically the, um, a tool set that gives teams everything they need for um, digital uh, collaborative teamwork. So you can write, you can vote, you can talk, you can chat, you can store data, you can uh, run memberships, so you can invite people and put them out again. You can. Uh, run projects and groups and form organizations and you can be presented on a map and you can be found for networking. So it's basically uh, something like a roundup service covering Facebook, uh, Google, uh, Trello um, and uh, uh, Doodle. And uh, we combined basically 70% of the functionality because we obviously are not funded the way others are and try to provide everything we can as uh, user-friendly as possible. Um, yeah, and my personal role there is to talk to civil society 
uh, agents. Uh, this, these can be in administrative groups, uh, in the climate protection uh, managers in the cities. This can be organizations, NGOs like both and or just uh, foundations that want to run their members and um, provide them with tooling. Um, and we help to develop forward. Um, and basically the, the paradigm is just like um, the old uh, cooperative buying a combine for a lot of different farmers that uh, cannot afford a good combine by themselves. So we collect money from organizations and add to the feature list of WeChange. And with every new client, we can uh, improve a bit. Um, we get monthly fees. Um, for uh, maintaining the code, it's all open source. It's all uh, programmed in Python Django. And um, we did all of that by ourselves. And we're now basically changing our core habits from being a platform which we coded into an orchestrator and OS, which runs a lot of different uh, other projects like Nextcloud and RocketChat in our platform. So we're developing forward and then um, I'm here to, to talk about needs and wishes of civil society and how we can best support them to grow into ours and other platforms and how we can connect to other existing projects. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Joan, uh, can you hear me now? Sorry, my voice is breaking from here. Yes. Uh, yes, I believe I think Dr. Johan left, but it would be great also for you, Kushal, to introduce yourself as well to us. Yeah, so I am, um, hi everyone, like my name is Kushal Das. I'm a public interest technologist at Freedom of the Press Foundation. I'm part of various other groups, like uh, part of the TOR project also. And my day job, I build software uh, like Secure Crop, which helps people to talk to journalists safely. And I actually will not spend time on this. Uh, like we have a few questions, I think, based on which we can start the discussion. Uh, the initial question actually I want to ask is that how we can investigate democracy and the idea of decentralization in terms of participation of the people to their respective countries. Uh, who wants to go first? Um, I don't mind to go first. I think um, it's a very big question. And I think um, if I heard correctly in the previous panel, they said that a lot of it has to do also with the how you sort of um, enact democracy in your own country. I think it, it varies quite differently in different countries um, as we see now. I live currently in the UK, um, just not gonna be part of the EU soon. Um, and uh, I think things are done really differently. I think that the, the mechanism and the instruments that are giving to citizens are not enough. I think a lot of people had hope from the GDPR that um, you know people, would be able to uh, sort of contest and object and things like that. And uh, I think a recent research showed by Brave, the browser showed that actually a very small percentage of people's uh, complaints and suits uh, are being handled with. So the DPAs, they're actually not equipped with handling that. They're under-resourced, uh, they don't have enough mechanisms. So um, I think that um, the GDPR is great, is a great mechanism, but to, at the moment it's totally dysfunctional and it doesn't really help people. And we also have to ask which kind of people, who has the time, uh, who can actually uh, object um, and has the resources to, to sort of deal with that. We have organizations uh, like uh, None of Your Business, which is Max Schlem's um, organization, who is a, a lawyer from Austria that's sort of one of the hailing this kind of um, objecting big uh, corporations. Uh, tech corporations, but I think that um, at the moment, a lot of citizens don't really feel like they have the opportunity to sort of uh, object things. So I think at the moment, the process is is uh, flawed and we need to rethink how to empower citizens to uh, not only make uh, interventions at the end of these kind of processes, right? Like the GDPR basically says, oh, we already have all of these technologies and now you can either object or maybe not and we'll see what happens and maybe we'll give a big fine to Google and whatever, that doesn't really help. So um, if citizens can make interventions before different kind of technologies are being developed or during the process, I think that will be a much more meaningful way for people to be able to say, wait a second, first of all, do we actually need these technologies? How are they disrupting our democracies and societies? And then we can move forward. So that's. Um, what I think. That's a good start. And so, Mikhail, you want to add something? 
Yeah, I would like to add something because actually I think it all starts with a lot of awareness and training and a lot of people that we would want to participate are not even literate enough to talk about the, their wishes and their problems. And the first thing we would have to start with is to communicate outward loud that we have the goal to create something like a digital governance uh, structure where everybody can participate. And we don't have the tools. We have intervention tools and we have uh, big corporates offering tools that have uh, doubtable conditions behind and business models behind that are not uh, mainly supporting our democracy and our uh, stability in our neighborhoods. And the, the way we think this should go, and maybe it's not the, the, the right point, but I would like to offer it, is we, sh we think we should start with very local regional lighthouse projects where we aim to communicate that this is a process where we want to start engaging everybody, people that are offline engaged, people that are already digitally engaged, and together develop open source tools and ways to interact and to form sort of the fourth digital citizen chamber in our democratic system where people can at least mention their ideas and their solutions so we don't start everything over again in every single spot. But I think digitalization of uh, de democracy has to start with a local anchor, with local role models and invitations that are uh, running alongside an offline process where people have a place to go to and ask questions, where people have a place to go to and contribute, and where there is an obvious question of how do we want to create and live in this neighborhood here, because that triggers more engagement than the big overall question of um, democratic participation on European level, which obviously would be the final goal at the end, or maybe a worldwide public um, co-creation. But I think we are so far off our goals that we have to start with an offline process locally, with a lighthouse communication, let's try something else on our own feed, on our own ideas to co-create our local community and use digital means to raise our voice and be heard and participate in the governance processes and then create good ideas and learn from others and combine that and then use all the powerful digital tools to become better and better and better and share that and be uh, yeah and then basically it comes to the point of open data um, of public money public code um, and of transparency obviously but as i said main point we're not there yet we have to start with awareness with training with engagement and some local uh, initiatives growing the process. Correct. And I think uh, building up those local communities will also change a lot how that's going to happen. <clears throat> Sorry. Thanks to the let's see, current situation in the world of COVID. And uh, Sab Sabine? Yeah, I think you, you, make a, yeah, the, you make a very interesting point um, that is COVID and, and the way now um, there is also consciousness to suddenly create tools that are digital and absolutely I agree that those are the tools of the future as we see this as well. But what also happens is uh, the, the consciousness of we have to create something on a local level so that not only people engage but also it is something important uh, to understand the small little details of the local infrastructure to then lay it out onto, onto a larger. Right now, you know, it feels like everything is top down, the infrastructure, everybody's talking a big game. We're talking about billions of euros here and there. Um, and uh, it doesn't really trickle down to the individual citizen so, um, so absolutely, I agree with, with Eleanor and Michael there um, very much. I think, however, that um, I have lived in the US um, for the last 27 years. I moved two years ago, literally when GDPR um, became into effect because of that. And everybody else thinks I'm crazy. Exactly, Mikhail. Um, because to me, that at least shows us that there is an awareness um, on, a, on, a, on a European wide level. So I think we shall not, uh, being coming from the US, mis, um, misunderstand that. Uh, it is very complex to work in that space. So if this for policymakers, extremely difficult to understand all the details of technical systems, infrastructures, data, and all of that. Um, but I think that we shall take that 
at least that um, framework that we have as sort of like a small little piece into the ability to create tools that are on a local level doing their part. Uh, and again, I really truly believe in privacy by design. I think it's extremely important. Also what that means is that currently citizens do not understand what is literally happening with their data. And it's not about, you know, when people come back to me and say, hey, I don't care whether they know that my cat is in the next tree or my neighbor is, you know, watering their plants. It's about making sure that citizens understand that uh, there is um, a great deal of manipulation um, that is happening through their usage of tools they consider to be free. Um, and it's not free. Those tools are not free. Uh, they come with the price of really infringing our democracy, our you know, freedom of speech, um, our ability to um, really make informed decisions. Um, and so it is for me very important that we educate citizens also um, and that there is an involvement on the grassroots level that actually is, uh, is a positive. So it's not about always, they are doing, not doing the right thing, you know, they're like, da, da, da. but it's like, okay, what are the things that I can do within my community and we shall provide them with the tools and that is our, um, that we, we, we must do that. You know, those of us who are discussing this topic, we must do it. We have, you know, the knowledge and the means uh, to do this. And so we shall empower our, our friends and families and neighbors. So that brings us into an interesting discussion is that when exactly the citizens should be you know, empowered to participate in this whole process. Should we be able to participate in the evolution process before anything starts off or like uh, as it was mentioned before, like in GDPR where everything was ready and then like one way is given up on top of all the citizens. So I want to hear what do you think about it? Um, maybe I will start because I also want to mention um, our project. Thinking. Our project is around citizens delegated literacies. We just started it. Um, we've done the first phase where we've done a survey. Uh, what we discovered is that actually uh, people's uh, data literacies are very different according to their socioeconomic status and also education um, uh, sort of attainment. So that means that we discovered also a group, which is uh, young people who come from poor backgrounds and lower education uh, skills who are also not that skilled in terms of understanding their data, in terms of doing things with their data. Um, so while I, I completely agree with you, I think that we need to remember that, first of all, there's, uh, at least in the UK, there's 10 mil million people who do not use the internet at all. Um, there's a lot of people who do not have um, access to different kind of uh, smartphones and things like that. So a lot of things that we're talking about are much larger systemic issues of inequality, uh, that an education especially that needs to be addressed. Another thing that I, I think is quite important, um, I don't know the situation in other countries in, in Europe, maybe the other participant can um, say something about that, but we don't have a lot of public spaces where we can actually gather and talk and train about these stuff. So in the UK in the past decade, more than 800 libraries got closed because of cuts and austerity done by the Tories. Um, and these are spaces basically that are meant for people who both don't have uh, uh, internet, don't have the facilities, but also can ask librarians who, as we all know, uh, are the Google search uh, of the past, um, and they can basically help people. Um, but that's also places where we can do workshops and basically talk to citizens in a place that's not commercialized. So while we have a lot of other spaces and spheres in our life that are being commercialized, um, and I don't know if you saw that the UK is collaborating with different kind of big tech technologies like Palantir, uh, in Google when it comes to NHS uh, data around COVID. So while we have those moves of sort of a lot of our public sector and uh, public dimensions being commercialized, a lot of the free public spaces where we can actually meet and gather and train each other and talk about these stuff are being minimized. And so I think that we need to think about this as well because um, basically people don't have uh, places to go. So. Um, I think the first move would be uh, to dedicate more funding to free 
spaces where people can gather and talk about these stuff. The second move would be to recognize that we have very big discrepancies in terms of understanding um, data and, and data literacy. Uh, and so um, these would be first steps, but I, I'm still standing behind my uh, uh, sort of argument that I think that the whole way of governing needs to change where citizens are part of the, uh, the discussion in advance. I was part of the e-privacy uh, regulations cons consultation, and I can tell you that from 400 people, there were 395 lobbyists and maybe five people from, you know, civil society and academics. So, you know, citizens are not part of these discussions. Um, and we need to make sure that they are uh, not only after these things are already made, but also, you know, from the from their inception. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, actually, I was, uh, was going to use this uh, also to answer the question from the chat. So I, I think it's not the right way to start really top down with a big uh, referendum model and uh, do exactly what other countries do, although it might be a really good thing to do. I can't even judge that. But I think the, the point really is to start with local spaces. And um, at least in Germany, we do have still a lot of those libraries. Um, we do have maker spaces and labs, um, but we do not have um, the, the open awareness that something like a town hall meeting or something like a neighborhood chat and these digital spaces that the startup scenes or the founders use, the, some cool kids use to 3D print some skateboard parts, and the libraries for the old people and the really small kids that this is one single category of space, which is a political, um, regional, local space of um, opinion building, of exchange, of co-creation. And we would have to sort of frame these spaces so that um, people would go there. And then we would have to also invest into uh, these role models, into trainers, into people that are actually as helpful as people uh, trying to sell Apple stuff in Apple stores. Um, and you can actually see how you can get people into, into digital um, literacy and it's showing them the first steps and then making software better. Um, but it has to start with the question of why and how. And the why is obviously that we need a new sort of way to interact in our communities and people are longing for that. They want to have their voices heard and their their their, um, the, their biggest problem solved, and be it the trash lying around or the school being crappy or um, not enough plants out there, or I don't know, some COVID uh, issues lately, obviously that people want to discuss. But I think we would have the infrastructure to do that. We would just have to dedicate it and, and uh, make sure that everybody knows what, what the need is. And there is one very interesting project that sort of, sort of got paused during COVID and it was the digital agenda of our um, Ministry for uh, Preservation and this Umweltministerium, um, they started the digital agenda where they said we need local spaces for education. We need to combine all aspects of sustainability and digitalization and we have to frame both together because if we don't, digitalization will be more a problem than a part of the solution. But if we would put it together and think about the uh, uh, people, planet, profit, sort of combination of digitalization, we have a chance to use these tools to solve some of the problems we have, make data available and make power accessible and make decisions transparent. Um, and I hope this will get sort of a restart when, when Germany takes over the, the um, European um, Ratspräsidentschaft. I don't even know how that is called in English. But um, yeah, so I, I guess there is some ideas around here which we could start with and it's the local spaces. Yes, and local spaces has much more bigger reach in every country, like depending on whether it's a maker place or like as simple as library, like, which is almost available in every country. Uh, Sabine, you want to add something? Uh, yeah, I actually, I want to echo Eleanor's comment because I think um, uh, it varies from country to country in with now if we stay within Europe, but also of course in the world. Um, it, uh, it is a huge problem uh, in terms of inclusion, um, digital inclusion. So I think um, we need to create new models of how we can include uh, those fringe groups, quote unquote, I call them now digital fringe groups that are not 
uh, you know, don't have their own phones, don't have access to the internet. Um, and literally there are areas in, in, in continental Europe that have a, 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 the worst infrastructure, a worse infrastructure than Angola or South Africa. So um, it, it's a very interesting uh, thought uh, as well. Um, and uh, so that is one, and I think we need to create models um, to provide um, you know, our old tools to exactly those groups uh, to um, uh, be able to, uh, you know, on a policy level, make sure that there is access to the internet, uh, because that is, if you don't have access to the internet nowadays, in particular now through COVID, a lot of schools are going online. Uh, so suddenly you have kids that, you know, can't really do their homework or do any schooling at all, because for the last two or three months, they have been without any classroom tool, which is right now the internet or uh, their computers. Um, they have to share one computer if they have one within, you know, three or four people within a home. So there are lots of different things that uh, we need to tackle that very much has to do with, um, with the, uh, the wealth, um, you know, inequalities. Um, so, you know, I'm definitely, uh, you know, thinking of models like, uh, you know, giving a computer to, uh, to one household that can't afford or like, I'm just throwing it out, certain programs that we have to think about. There's a lot of excess of machinery and tools uh, lying around and, you know, um, startups that died <laughs> to, to big corporations that are outsourcing now to another country and, uh, and you have facilities that are dead. Uh, so you have a lot of equipment lying around. So it's just literally about, you know, uh, finding a way to, to, or an organization or, you know, some element uh, empowering organizations that are existing because there are quite a few around to really make sure that there's a there's equality um, in having the tools, having access, and of course also having the financial means. That of course has a few other uh, implications as well. Um, but going back to to digital and data, because that's you know uh, that's where I come from. Um, I think it is um, also important, and that is a model that that you know I've been throwing around for quite a while. To me, data is a raw material, and uh, you know, um, right now, uh, you know, we're acting as as and I'm just a harsh word, but I like to use it. I uh, am almost we're like prostitutes to the large corporations that are basically just abusing our data and. Um, uh, they're just taking it and they don't really care what's happening with us. Um, they just make a shitload of money with it and do not give back. So I think that model to me does not work. Um, so I think, um, again, if we now take it down to empowering citizens and giving citizens also the ability to actually be part of that economy, uh, being a member of that economy, you know, having a vote in that company, you know, or in that setup uh, and owning it, uh, you know, it's a completely different way of, of, of you know, thinking about it, using a tool, um, uh, thinking about empowerment, um, you know, so it's not about these guys on the top are making all the decisions. No, I can be part of the decision making process. And then you can decide whether you want or not. Uh, so then it's up to you. Um, but I think that to me is, is another layer um, that is highly important in particular now through the COVID crisis um, that has shown us, and I don't like the word crisis. I think it's a, it's a little bit of a wake up call. Um, so uh, so it, it really shows, it really just pinpoints exactly all the, the inequalities that Eleanor had pointed out in a very, very drastic, quick way makes us, you know, um, to make decisions um, to, you know, empower, you know, technologies, empower people to really help themselves in many instances, because there is no other help possible. Um, and, and really making clear what is important to be a human being, um, you know, so um, again, I, I think uh, it's an interesting way for me to think about you know, um, economies, um, 
you know, societies uh, and uh, ecology per se, but then also how we can use a technology and humanize technology because right now technology is just, I'm, you know, I'm a tech geek, so, you know, um, but there is technology and then there is the human and we need to put them together now. Uh, I really like the last line, uh, the way you define that, how like we should make these two things work together. And that actually creates two diff uh, different questions. But again, I think both of them are interrelated. Uh, one thing, again, I'll go back to Eleanor's comment where she meant, uh, like uh, Eleanor mentioned that uh, like out of 400 people, there are 395 lobbyists and only five people who are from the society in general. Uh, and like, so what all things uh, like can be the motivation or incentives for people to voluntarily participate in this kind of discussions or grassroots movements? And also the related point, which I want to throw in at the same time is, what is the role of technology in all these movements? So whoever wants to pick up first. Um, Sabine, I can see. Yeah, okay, Elena, go ahead. Sorry, well, if somebody else wants to start, it's no problem. Uh, you volunteer. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I just want to mark something uh, with uh, Sabine that um, I actually don't agree that we need to uh, keep on with this business model of trading. So I don't think that people need to trade their own data. I think that we need to reconsider in general, if I understood correctly. Uh, I, I just think we don't need to participate and we need to think about different kind of companies and how they represent us. But as to your question, um, I think that people are already uh, participating in a lot of uh, grassroots activities. I don't know if you've seen all the Black Lives Matter demonstrations across uh, Europe and also in UK. So I think um, people who are more politically uh, engaged are already engaging. Um, I think it's more difficult to encourage uh, people uh, who are maybe less maybe engaged because first of all, again, the, the inequality, um, being part of this means that you need to have time, uh, that you need to have funding. Um, if you are poor, you're probably working in several jobs uh, and probably in your free time, you don't really wanna do all of these activities. So we need to see um, how um, we can develop different kind of tools, whether they're technological or not, um, that is the question. I don't think that technology um, can always save us. So this kind of uh, tech solutionism of like, you know, we just need to find an app to, to solve that. I think that's the wrong way to go. I think that we need to collaborate with or a lot of a lot of organizations already exist. So for example, we are collaborating in our research with the Good Things Foundation, which is a foundation um, that uh, has different kind of centers across the UK and it helps people to do very, you know, uh, basic things like applying for a job or applying for universal credit. Um, and I think that if we can uh, use already existing infrastructures uh, and then sort of enhance them, that will be great because I think we don't need to. So in our projects, one of our mottos is not to make these kind of interventions that are short-lived a lot of the literacy programs are like oh let's do something for a year but then like you know you can teach people and first of all they would forget and second of all you know what happens after a year how do you know that you know they actually understood so um sort of um enhancing already existing infrastructures help you to create sustainable uh long-term projects that actually make sense so i think that we need to See which kind of organizations already exist in different kind of sectors um, and then to create sort of different and, and to expand their um, activities because trying to do this kind of hey we have this new technology why don't you use it that almost never works um, and we do see like in, in the digital literacy and the digital inclusion uh, industry that a lot of these kind of programs you know you run it for two months you run it until your funding is over and then what happens? People still need help. People still need, also like just to ask questions. So there is this new technology. What do I do with it? Who do I ask? And this is why I'm coming back to the notion of libraries because libraries are long sustainable and these are places where you can actually do these kind of different activities. I think that um, we're never gonna get everybody on board because of different kind of considerations. Um, of course, there's, there's inequality, there is uh, also gender, issues that are going into that, uh, who has the time to deal with that. But I think that if we can 
uh, managed to reach some people and in a growing capacity, then that can maybe help. Is it okay if I go, Michael? Because yes. I, I think, because right, right, right. no, I, I'm totally with you on that one. When I talked about literacy, I did not talk about digital literacy and the and the things that you just mentioned as two months type thingies, whatever, quickies, like, you know, whatever. That That's not me, okay? That's not what I meant with that. What I meant is is more about creating awareness um, and, and absolutely using the existing infrastructures like a library. That's why I said before, like, how do we, how do we include and how do we actually create sharing projects, you know? So maybe I wasn't clear when I said, you know, okay, so, so ha let's have a, and let's use library as a metaphor now, hey, let's have the library, let's have the setup there so that, you know, people can go there. So that's, that's, that's sort of like more what I meant, not the, yeah, not this other thing that makes us just be, you know, be happy for two months and then we did something good and then yeah. history. Yeah, no, 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 not like that. I just want to add as and well, I'm because, sorry that I'm interrupting, uh, um, that there is a difference between awareness and being active. And this is something that we also deal with in our framework because you can understand what's happening, but if we're not providing tools to actually make a difference, which what we call in our framework data activism, uh, you're not really gonna, you know, I can, you know, I can understand how cookies are working and I can, you know, put like a privacy badger and things like that. That's not really, I mean, that's gonna help maybe me individually, but in my community, not really. So how do we sort of develop different programs that also uh, help people understand what they can do to change, how they can use data for change, different kind of, you know, because um, I'm not like completely against it, Technology, but the way that literacy programs are focusing on awareness and awareness is maybe the first step, but there is another step of actually, what can I actually do with data? How can I organize my community to do the things that matter to us and things like that, so. Yeah, uh, actually, sorry, to... I'm not... Okay, Mikhail, uh, like, uh, go ahead, you have one minute <laughs> and then we can. I actually wanted to make a point on uh, actually both aspects, I think. Um, in user-centered design, what we have to do right now is the jobs to be done paradigm and figure out what problems people really have that are they're going to solve them anyhow. And if we offer a better solution with a better digital technology, we have an audience that listens. And in the local neighborhoods, there is a lot of people active uh, physically offline changing stuff. They're organizing cultural events. They help neighbors, especially in these COVID times. We have a lot of active people in the communities. And I think the way to go is to figure out how we can boost those initiatives, but making sure that we use good tools for that and not just the conventional first five picks and then explain people that ask, why do we do that? And then provide these people boosting existing initiatives with the right tools to make those tools adapt to the needs of those people and then learn from how we can support them best. That's what I meant with these lighthouse projects that we need. You need to start where existing problems are solved with old technologies and then boost those solutions with better technology and help that better technology to ripen with the next problem. And I think everybody in tech sort of knows that, but neither do people in governance and administration, nor do the, the local folks on the street really know who can actually be of help in solving that locally. And I think that's a big challenge for all of us to be sort of make sure that everybody knows that there is this path to yeah. a better sort of uh, co-creative governance locally. Thank you. Sorry, Michael. Uh, I'm going to stop you in this way because we have only one minute in this way if my clock is correct. I want to hear still like uh, a quick ideas of your like the future of grassroots movements. Like what would be your opinion if you can go fast? Michael, you are on the screen. So I would ask you first, maybe. Uh, make visible what is already there and make uh, um, sort of broadcasting and the storytelling um, better because that's what a lot of people cannot do. And we have a lot of really good initiatives amongst the Fridays for Future, but also amongst the people that were active since the 60s in the, in the green movement. And we have all these good ideas. We just have to make sure we can update them with latest technology and then make them scale. Yeah. Sabine, you want to go ahead? Yeah, no, I, I think... Um, it's, it's to, to me, it's empowerment. Um, I think it's, uh, it's really, it's empowerment. I think that's, uh, you know, and, and bringing the energy, um, you know, and um, yeah, I think that's the one word. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna reiterate what I, I said before to uh, enhance already existing infrastructures 
uh, and helping people and developing these kind of programs around uh, participation and actually changing, which is more than just um, awareness. Huh. So like a few of the points actually I kept hearing again and again, and one of the major thing I think all three of you uh, went ahead in the same style of like, you know, instead of building up new things, we should always focus on what exists right now and how we can improve starting from organizations to infrastructure to like the whole idea of like, you know, taking part, making participations easier for different people from different parts of our society. Uh, Elena, you are still there. Uh, not Elena, uh, the other, uh, I'm butchering the names, by the way. Elena, then. Uh. Okay, so thank you all once again for taking participations and our next session is going to start. Thank you, Kushal, for years. moderating this. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank everybody. You. It was lovely. Bye. 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 We connect.